Merle's a seaweed that forms living beds on the coast of the UK, mostly around the west coast of Scotland. For years, I've been searching for this hidden pinky purple treasure, like a detectorist. But instead of searching under the earth, I'm searching under the sea. My research methods for searching for Merle start with mapping, using information gathered by talking to fellow scientists, combined with reading reports by nature agencies interpreting sea charts and online mapping tools. Mill beds are not easy to find, even once you've narrowed down the area, because they lie hidden below this grey slate surface of the sea. You need special access to its world, and you should get in the water, with a mask on. It's a slow process, time consuming, weather dependent, brief and cold. Through getting me to ask why Merle is so important to me, this course has made me realise my relationship with Merle is more than just an interest, more than an obsession, it's a deep romance. Perhaps akin to the relationship Joseph Boys had with Bob, which gave rise to his performance artwork where he enveloped himself in its fabrics. Studying Merle using art rather than science has opened up whole new ways to explore and express my love. I like using everyday artistic methods and materials. To be inclusive with my six-year-old daughter Merle, everyday, quick, simple, interesting processes to keep us both engaged. I thought perhaps my methodology could be fandom in the first sector. Can you call it fandom if you don't have anyone else in your subculture? Rather than with other humans, I have feelings of empathy and camaraderie with the Merle and other sea life. This has made me realise I haven't up to this point really included humans in my work. When I asked myself why, my gut came back with bitterness. Humans get enough attention. And the rest of the ecosystem, especially the small and the hidden things, are neglected. It wasn't until last year when I let my art practice take the front seat that I began to understand the reasons why I've been so interested in Merle. It makes a wonderful visual model of complexity. I started searching for Merle around the same time as I handed in my PhD thesis in theoretical ecology, in which I thought a lot about ecosystem complexity. In the same way industrialised humans have typically managed nature, art related to nature can be reductive. Separating out single species like the giant panda or the Scottish salmon extracted from all its contextual complexity. Take Ernst Haeckel's art forms in nature. There are neat gaps between each creature. I want to cut them out, layer them up, because real life is layered and complex. The opposite of reductionism and holism, a word coined by Jan Smuts, that understanding a system can only be done as a whole. This footage is my first attempt at researching Mali underwater photography. I used a cheap equivalent of a GoPro, which sat in my drawer for years, waiting for this moment. I want to get back under the water with Mal, so I can observe it and draw it live. So I've started exploring methods for mark making underwater. I'm also developing another set of methods around bringing hidden treasures to the surface for people to appreciate by animating them, using Victorian technology like the Zerotrope, but also modern technology like augmented reality. But I have had some unexpected responses to these attempts, like my tutor Mick McGraw's reaction to black bristle stars. Where I see beauty, others see horror. There's much to do to unmalign and de-alienate the underwater world, and culture can play a big part in that. Director Steven Spielberg recently said he regrets the decimation of the shark population following the success of Jaws. This course has prompted further reflection on why I make mal art. I'd assume this could be explained with my ecological background and love of being underwater, but something else happened too. I ended up in Margaret Thatcher. I have a personal-ish relationship with Margaret Thatcher. I went to her school, had to wear her blue uniform, knowing that this did not reflect my family's politics. I lived my first 10 years of my existence under her reign as Prime Minister. One of the most interesting responses I've had to drawing her image, well, partial image, a lithographic pencil drawing of just her face. It was from an MFA student who thought it was a self-portrait. I wasn't taken aback by this as much as you might think. In fact, when I was drawing her eyes, it felt like I could have been drawing my own. When I said this, he mentioned Naomi Klein's recently published book called Doppelganger, where she explores this idea in relation to a right-wing sailor two people mistake her for. My doppelganger's government made a decision that would profoundly affect the UK's coastal ecosystems. The removal of the three mile limit around the UK coast to trawling and scallop dredging utterly destroyed fragile habitats like mulberds. 
he was spawning in nursery grounds for most of the fish that we eat and know, such as cod. There's a paper about this happening right on my doorstep. It's called The Ecological Meltdown in the Firth of Clyde. It's authored by Professor Callum Roberts and Ruth Thurston. I know Callum from studying under him at University of York. I'm still researching if this made the headlines at the time. Was there much resistance at the time? A few years ago, there was an attempt to reinstate the three mile limit. The campaigners were only looking for 1,000 signatures and they didn't even make that. So it's not clearly in the public consciousness. Having dedicated much of my life and work to learning about and conserving the natural world, I think Merle has become the manifestation of my despair over the lack of action that stem nature's destruction. Dead Merle watches, washes up on beaches like many bones and it grinds to form Scotland's spectacular white sand beaches. Did the beaches get a bit bigger after 1984 in the ninth mass destruction of Merle beds? Grieving is also cathartic and I can feel an emergence out of my feelings of despair driven paralysis and into reactivism. I would argue my current methodology is reparation. I need to make amends to give a voice to the voiceless, address the injustice even a tiny bit. The working title of my most recent work is called Maggie and the Mole. It's a dichromatic lithograph, por portrait with pinky purple mole encrusting her shoulders and face and a strangling black brittle star necketee from tentacular hair. I admit I was drawing on the terrifying tentacles a bit. Maybe I want those sea creatures to get their revenge. I knew this was my first crude stab at making amends with my art, but it threw me into ethical considerations. How do we give nature a voice when pitched against human livelihoods? I feel freer and more confident to make statements in my artwork than I ever could through my scientific work, but I still want them to be evidence-based. Am I taking an easy punt at prime villain, Margaret Thatcher? Not many people would complain about that. Things are usually not as black and white as they seem, though. I found an article saying it was the fishery scientists who advised the government the three mile limit was not needed for conservation. And there was one point in my life, my scientific career, where I worked with fishery scientists. What I'd like to research further is how do artists avenge histories of violence, express, repara express reparation, help make amends. I think I would be more comfortable with a quieter approach, more like Ellen Gallagher's watery ecstatic series. But then again, how do you get the message across when time is of the essence? and other voices are so much louder. I think Emlet Pia Carla Healy hits the nail on the head with her work, saying what needs to be said with factual speculation, if that's not an oxymoron. To paraphrase Carla, the world won't go extinct. Humans will. But I will disappoint Carla. I will finish on making as a hopeful act. My small little daughter, Laura.